welcome to the EO Roundtable series where we speak to optics experts about trends that are impacting our industry and beyond. I'm your host, Scott Bass, and today's topic is additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing encompasses many technologies from 3D printing to rapid prototyping and other layered manufacturing and additive fabrication techniques. I gathered some of our own Edmund Optics experts to share their insights on how additive manufacturing is not only shaping our industry, but really the world. For part one of this topic, we will explore the impact of additive manufacturing on the optics industry, different types of 3D printing, rapid prototyping, and recent developments in additive manufacturing. So let me first start by asking, where are you primarily seeing additive manufacturing being used in optics? Well, right now, I think mainly we've been seeing uh, used mostly for tooling, fixturing, prototyping. Um, the level of tolerancing and fidelity needed for an optical element doesn't seem to quite be there yet. But right now, I've primarily see it, seen it for prototyping and quicker turnaround of ideas to hardware in the lab. So that's the majority of where I'm seeing additive. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Joel, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think it's showing up all over the place. I mean, we're, like Katie said, we're using it for tooling in our factories today over in Singapore. But, uh, you know, I think when it comes to actually finished goods and finished products, you've got many different classes. And so certainly on the precision optics side, uh, it's not quite there yet, but they're, they're getting pretty close in the, the real small scale stuff, like mm -hmm. sub-millimeter thereabouts. But, um, but if you sort of split into precision optics and lesser uh, tolerance uh, classes like illumination optics or things like that, uh, they're actually much closer and, and actually are being used. So mm -hmm. things like reflectors, condensers, and, and areas like that, but um, homogeneities and things like that are, are still remain to be barriers for, for finished products in 3D printing. Interesting. Yeah, I guess to add to that, um, you know, obviously most of the 3D printing that's done these days is with polymers. Um, there's certainly places like GE that are pushing the boundaries in terms of metal, but in terms of, you know, the kind of high temperature materials like glass, um, that were traditionally used in optics, you don't see that in the 3D printing world so much. And so with polymers, you have temperature issues, yellowing, UV, a lot of other things that on the material side, I think still have to be addressed before that's really a winner. Well, and you're sharing us there's some stuff with uh, some powdered glass? And yeah, yeah, there's some neat things being done out there. So certainly different polymer formulations to try to open up that kind of span of index and dispersion. Uh, to make that a little bit broader range. Uh, there's some hybrid materials that are coming out now where they incorporate uh, nanomaterials or glass particles into a polymer so that when they print that, um, then they have some kind of hybrid between them in terms of properties. And even um, with things like uh, binder jetting, uh, some of the kind of more unusual printing processes, actually building glass powders up and then centering them later to form an optical element or potentially an optical element out of directly out of a glass. So there's some things coming around the corner that, that look promising, but right now they're still kind of in the air infancy. So we don't have to wait, um, we don't have to worry today that um, we're not going to be manufacturing glass, uh, you know, in the machines that we're using currently and someone's just going to be able to 3D print a lens. But uh, another area where I've definitely seen people of using it in, within optics, um, creating mounts uh, to actually hold the optical component inside of the mount and um, uh, creating, like you mentioned, fixturing and tooling. And you know, we use it in our lab to create a lot of the test development parts that we uh, um, use for uh, test beds that we create inside the uh, lab. Yeah, the tough thing is, is all the money is going into metal 3D printing, right. and so it's mostly metal um, right optics and, and things like that's kind of riding on the coattails. But I mean, we are benefiting from a lot of those uh, process improvements that, that they're seeing, and all that industry R&D money that's going into the metal side of things. Right, I think it's going to end up being more of a materials science problem more than the uh, actual mechanics of, of doing it, because there's so many things with the optical polymers, yeah. thermal and dispersion, sure. like you had mentioned, Nathan. That uh, that's where and, and getting your surface you know, form, your final figure, any sort of irregularities that maybe aren't as critical to a metal part, you're still hitting tolerances even if it's a little bit wavy, whereas putting wave into an optical element is uh, you know, something that's going to crash your applications. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, internal homogeneity, right? Normally in metal, avoid a particle, something like that in there. Yeah, it might be an issue. Um, for strength or whatever, but those are usually pretty big defects. But in optics, you're worried about things that are less than a micron in diameter being potential issues. So that homogeneity, you know, PPM level is really, really critical to get that to work right. Mm -hmm. I think that's a challenge they've just not had to deal with right. in traditional 3D printing. Well, there's a problem of uh, actually creating the, the object that you're 3D printing, and then there's the problem of 
scanning the object that you want to 3D print. And that's another area where optics is uh, a solution uh, for that, whether it's a, a machine vision lens that's capturing the object or whether it's a laser that's uh, scanning it as well. And then even the um, optic in front of the laser to either create a laser line or a matrix to, to capture the object. Um, the finer detail that we're trying to 3D print, the more demands you're going to have on those optics that are being used to scan the object that you're interested in. And certainly a nice growing customer base for us. Yeah. We've seen a lot more applications with 3D, 3D scanning and, uh, and measurement. Yeah, and metrology, they're trying to close the loop on that manufacturing mm -hmm. process instead of just hoping it comes out the right shape, actually measure as they go. Right. I've seen a lot more of that coming out lately too. Well, I was going to ask, what, what are some of the manufacturing challenges out there um, that are creating a higher demand for additive manufacturing? Certainly the rapid prototyping yeah. is, is a big one, right? People want to have their optics in a couple of days, you know, and so with traditional means that's really hard to achieve, but mm -hmm. in theory, at least with 3D printing, it could be done quite easily. Especially depending upon what kind of uh, prototype that you're looking to get. If you're looking to get something that's actually functional mm -hmm. or some minimum viable uh, prototype that you just need to put in front of your device to get something else out of there, um, there are definitely opportunities for 3D printing to take advantage of of some of those types of things rather than having something that's fully functional. Right. Well, and it's the same um, kind of corner of the world that additive lives in for metal that it does for optics. It's low volume, high speed, and then also high complexity. So with metal, you can do a lot more things with 3D printing and complexity um, than you can with traditional machining. And it's the same for optics. You know, printing, 3D printing a free form is going to be a significantly easier thing to do than trying making a freeform with traditional manufacturing methods. So How does that impact optical performance? I mean, you have more degrees of freedom. You can use less elements, lower cost. Um, you can solve a lot more problems than you can with a traditional rotationally symmetric optic. So if you have an easier and cheaper way to print a higher complexity uh, component, you know, it's, uh, it's good all around for your swap, your size, weight, and power. Um, yep. That's going to open up a whole lot of design solutions that normal designers wouldn't think of uh, trying to go forth and, and do. Um, is that going to change uh, how you even go about designing something in a software package? Mm -hmm. well, it's a real fun time to be an engineer, right? Because I've mean, yeah. been using the, this, these homogeneous uh, glass elements for you know, hundreds of years mm -hmm. now, and, and now we're really starting to see you know, gradient index solutions and freeform solutions and, and being able to actually just hit a button and see it appear before your eyes, right in front of you. It's, it's kind of cool. Exciting. I mean, it's not quite there yet, but I mean, by the end of our careers, I mean, I fully anticipate it to be there. Yeah, you're already seeing people starting to try out printing with, with grins, and um, we're seeing so many applications now that are, have to be lighter weight, so, you know, drone applications and robotics where you care about what it's getting mounted onto. So being able to print in a polymer or lighter weight material um, certainly helps. So it sounds like companies like MN Optics uh, really need to embrace this to, to stay competitive. Is that is that true? Well, yeah, there's certainly the threat of being left behind if we don't. Um, you know, if somebody else is going to get there, you know, three times quicker than we are with you know a comparable solution, or at the very least something physical that you can pass around a, a sales meeting or something like that, uh, versus us showing there just you know, talking about something. Yeah, I mean, we, we need to be participating in this heavily, and, and we are. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that uh, you know it's. You see everyone around you. There's a lot of conferences popping up about these things, and tons of publications uh, throughout the world on this this topic. So, yeah, I think one of the things I'm really excited about is the potential to kind of bridge the gap between the researchers, the foundations that are doing the fundamental basic building blocks, and then getting that material to market because a lot of them don't have the experience that a larger company like us has been heavily involved in that for a long time would have in terms of distribution and, and design for manufacturing and all the other aspects that would go along with not just being able to make it, but being able to make it work. And truthfully, if you're an engineer and you want to sell your idea to somebody um, versus having a presentation with all the facts and figures, if you can 3D print something and put it on a table and hand it to somebody, yeah. You know, that, that makes it real for them right. and, and more likely that you're going <laughs> to yeah. get your idea funded. Yeah. Right. Customers, board meetings, stakeholders, yeah. all that that's stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. It goes a long way and that's, it's almost like the, the benefit that you get from a 3D print. Yes, there could be the margin and the cost and, and all of that, you know, of, of selling a finished product, but actually just going and getting something funded. Like if I'm a small startup and I'm trying to get a VC funding going, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's right. very, very powerful to show up and there's, there's a huge right. benefit to invest in 3D printing just for something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw recently somebody had 3D printed a cross-section of their assembly just so they could 
as an educational tool show, uh, and that was a polymer jet printing, so you could print different colors. So it showed all of the individual pieces in different colors, and it was just a great visual to be able to yeah. point and have that 3D, so even from an education standpoint. It's Absolutely. Yeah. How are we using 3D printing beyond just optics, like tooling, or like what? Well, like one of the big projects I was recently involved in was re looking again at some of our packaging solutions. So how can we have better packaging that might um, protect the optics better, give a better value to the customer? So rather than sort of paying thousands and thousands of dollars for a mold to be made and again, get injection molded parts, you can quickly print up a prototype, see if you, how your parts fit, how does it all work together? So that's you know a great way to kind of explore that space. We've uh, used it in the factory in a number of ways. We um when you're making optics and wanting to shoot uh, slurry between a grinding wheel and, a, and an optical mm -hmm. surface, uh, a lot of times uh, you have four or five nozzles to choose from that came from the machine supplier. You try out different ones and you get all the, the different uh, liquid spray patterns and you're just like, gosh, I wish I could just get it to fan out in this, this particular way. And, uh, and so our Singapore engineers have uh, 3D printing and they, they have a whole 20 or 30 different you know, starts and, and fits and fails, but then they finally found the one that just sprays it and a nice perfect mm -hmm. uh, fan out that gets the nice distribution that we were looking for. And it's, you don't need a lot of them, so you're never going to you know, go in and get someone's attention to go and make you that part or do a, a mold tool or something. And so areas like that is where we've, and I think, cost us 50 cents or a dollar or something like that to make those. And uh, now if you walk down some of our lines in the factory, you can see just copies uh, throughout uh, the whole line. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's interesting how, um, you know, we're talking about how you know, 3D printing really changing many industries in, in the world and how you just mentioned that little plastic nozzle whoever's making those right now they're mm -hmm. they have to adjust their business and they're, they're probably losing out from you being able to to print those on demand right so what kind of challenges do we face in the optics industry when companies have access to the same 3d printing where they might be able to do something on their own that we used to do for them like what what do how is that going to impact us or companies like us, and what do we need to do about it? I mean, it? maybe it's naive to think that traditional optics polishing will never go away, but in my mind, you know, there's a lot of advances in manufacturing technology for metal, and we haven't seen traditional, nobody's gotten rid of all their mills and lathes in the factory, right? They've um, added on newer machining. So I don't see that necessarily traditionally uh, manufactured optics are going to go away, but I think we'd be also naive to think that some of the business at Edmund Optics wouldn't be replaced by somebody being able to print their own optic in their lab rather than ordering it off the shelf out of a, out of a catalog. So um, you kind of made the point already, there's like a service aspect to, uh, you know, maybe somebody can 3D print an optic, but do they know what to do with it? Um, do they have the supporting, you know, knowledge in terms of prototyping? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, being able to support our customer base in terms of what are they doing with those optics? Maybe maybe we provide 3D printing. Or maybe we provide models and say you can go ahead and print it, but we're going to help you. Uh, we're going to help you integrate that into your system or understand the performance or the limitations or, or something like that. So I think it will shift some of our business, but you know, I don't see us not having glass optics. Right. Well, <laughs> well, similar to how uh, some of this is even done for metal, I think we might open up a world to doing post processing of 3D mm -hmm. printed mm -hmm. optics yeah. where. The 3D printer is going to get you to a certain point, right. and you know someone like us will have the ability to uh, create that final shape for yeah. you um, after you've already 3D printed the the lens yeah. to for a higher level of precision. There will always be a higher level right. of precision yeah. um, yeah. out there yeah, and absolutely. applications to take advantage of it. Yeah. So I think there's an opportunity to, uh, there to uh, grow the industry in that direction. I mean. Fundamentally, 3D printing is a serial process, right? You do one at a time. In fact, you do little pieces of one at a time, right? So compared to large parallel manufacturing for large volume, obviously that's not going to go anywhere anytime soon, just from a cost perspective, if nothing else. It's just interesting how it just forces every company, no matter what industry you're in, you have to adjust somehow mm -hmm. because of this, right? We have a generic attack plan in R&D, right? It's, it's what parts yeah. can you control? and perhaps a corner in the market and, and have that be your differentiating technology and what parts you know, are just going to be permeated beyond your control. And that's, um, So when it comes to 3D printing, there are companies out there that are uh, spending a lot of time and effort on, you know, call it the fuel that goes into the uh, 3D printer. And so Nathan was mentioning the different types of materials um, that are out there. There's a lot of IP being generated in that and certainly you know, if you can only buy that, that type of material from that one company, that's, that's an area of the market that could be cornered. 
uh, we're not a materials company, but um, but we can certainly uh, see the value in some of those different differentiating materials that are out there that are going into 3D printing. Interesting. So let's just go around the room. I'm just curious, just your take on, we're talking somewhat present to, you know, short term, how, how this, you know, 3D printing out of manufacturing is impacting our industry, but let's look way out in the future. Where do you think we're going to be 10, 15 years of how this technology is going to evolve, whether in our industry or outside? Just curious of, you know, your thoughts since you're so close to it. So starting with you, Katie. Um, I mean, in terms of optics, I would imagine it would follow somewhat of a parallel path or follow along to metal. So where we're seeing metal now, we'll probably see optics there in, I don't know if it's 5 or 10 or 15 years, but um, I think there'll always be fundamental limitations when we're doing printing. If, if some of these glass powders, you can actually recreate a glass element, maybe they'll get to that at some point. Um, but uh, in terms of polymer, there's so many material limitations there. I, I think there's absolutely a space. I mean, right now we're already seeing it used in illumination and, and things just not high precision imaging. So I think at some point the, the quality of the material science, the, the polymers that are being used and the procedures will get to high and higher precision. Um, and then, I know the sky's kind of the, the limit there. I just think you're going to see significantly shorter times in terms of optical system development. I think right now optics subsystems tend to have the reputation of being the longest lead time in a system. And so maybe we are no longer your... <laughs> you know, your slowest part to, to market in a, in a system. Um, so I think we're already seeing the speed of industry going faster and faster. I think this will just enable it um, with, with some fundamental limitations in my eyes, but I, I imagine I will be designing, or hope I will be designing imaging systems, including some 3D printed uh, elements in, within my career for sure. Great. Thanks about you, Ken. Sure. I think it's going to change the way we actually develop product. I mean, if you take the uh, typical lead time of eight or six weeks for, for, um, for an optic and you're developing or making something with that and all of a sudden you can do that in a day, I don't necessarily have to spend as much time uh, proving out my design in, in software right. or, or um, intolerancing initially. I can uh, fail fast and so fast that I can fail often. So I think it's actually going to change the way uh, um, we design, how much planning we, we do up front, how much tolerancing and, and uh, upfront work uh, we do within product development, and then just continue to iterate and, and try empirically uh, uh, versus um, uh, taking more time to actually sh put more into design and strategy of something. Interesting. Nathan? I think uh, uh, one of Ken's points earlier is, is, is possibly telling in that, you know, sort of, can you get there with the, the precision that you need right out of the 3D printer, or do you need to do some post-processing? So it could well be that, you know, one of the, the kind of stepping stones to be, you know, to getting that holy grail moment where you're just 3D printing optics is, you know, 3D printing the preform, basically, where you're going to take that and do some sort of post-process to make it the final optic. Um, certainly that'll save time um, in terms of, you know, getting material in, how much you need to keep in inventory, do I need to keep giant blocks of glass, or maybe I just need a jug of, you know, whatever polymer material that we're going we're gonna to use to build that. So once you can do those quickly and easily, there again you get to that, you know, maybe it's not as fast as full 3D printing, but still very quickly being able to work through prototypes and variations on your design and things like that. Great. Joel. So I think, you know, with any market arena or stuff like that, you have uh, the holy trinity of speed, quality, and cost, and that, you know, is kind of a function of do I need a few pieces or, or a lot of pieces. And so um, the dynamics within 3D printing kind of play in a, in a, you know, small volume, low quality, high, uh, you know, quick turnaround kind of things. But the uh, uh, time it takes to print multiple pieces, you know, is still quite long. And so I think the, the high volume game is still out of reach. Um, for, th for 3D printing, and so I don't really see that, that happening, which means cost at high volume is probably um, out of range, and so the, the incumbent methods are probably here, here for quite a while, and so I think 3D printing is probably going to get on kind of a plateau uh, for a while. We'll, we'll chip away at quality and try to get these things a bit better and better over time, uh, but you're still going to be limited by some of the speed factors, but there's a group at MIT that um, has already kind of demonstrated a, th a tenfold increase in some of the, the print times of you know, hours from a one-inch part down to minutes. And so th there are some leaps uh, that are occurring in the research community right now that are starting to point towards uh, being able to go faster and faster with these things. And, and that will you know, help it push up into the volume and, and cost side of things, but quality still remains a barrier. Great. All very interesting. Anything else to add on this topic? 
Well, I think one of the most compelling applications for just 3D printing is how it has the potential to just um, change the world in its biomedical applications, you know, creating uh, scaffolds that, that dissolve and being able to print, uh, you know, uh, implants specific to people or yeah, like uh, casts, That's right, yeah. That's what right. Or, or tissue yeah. uh, um, for an organ. Uh, I think uh, there's some compelling arguments to 3D printing uh, changing our health and, and uh, quality of life in the future. And to be a part of that uh, on the optics side is, is still uh, intriguing. Yeah, we focus a lot on optics today, but it's much more active outside the optics Absolutely. industry. I think yeah. Adidas is printing Hundreds Souls of thousands of shoes, shoes. Uh -huh. and rubber and <laughs> yeah. stuff. And so it's uh, uh, between that and some of the aerospace <clears throat> activity. I mean, that's where a lot of the money is and a lot of the activity. Yeah, and we'll probably end up being somewhat bounded by standards that are set, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, cost right. structures that are set in some of the, those industries. But uh, the nice thing is they are moving fast or moving forward quite, quite quickly. Maybe this is a wishful thinking, but I imagine if you can 3D print an optic, you have a lot of, you know, garage and weekend warrior engineers mm -hmm. that are 3D printing things in their basement right now that are fun toys or maybe something right. more more than that they're building for their home. So, you know, if you have access to th printing 3D optics, do we have a, a new class of amateur optical yeah. designers yeah. and yeah. hobbyists and things? Yeah. I mean, again, maybe that's wishful thinking, but to bring more people in the field, if you can print your own telescope, you know, if you're a hobbyist, you know, does that start bringing more people in uh, into the field or understanding what the field of right. optics yeah, is? I certainly do. My brother just printed me some adapters to hold a, a pool light uh, in place. Yeah, <laughs> at, see? At my home. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, use it all over the place. Yeah. So are students in optical programs learning about these things now? Is that yeah. core oh, part yeah. of the curriculum? Right? Mm -hmm. not, I think you've yeah. seen 3D printers get added into every major yeah. mm -hmm. engineering and technical yeah. lab in yeah. universities. Yeah, not just optics by any means. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, we got a little spooked a couple of years ago. I think it was a group in the University of Michigan uh, started printing some uh, optomechanics. Uh -huh. uh, and, <laughs> and they kind of had a whole whole suite of interconnecting uh, cage system lit style optomechanics and, and, you know, did it on the open source type of thing. And I was like, oh my gosh, and we got some of it and it didn't quite have the alignment accuracy that, that should scare us, but it was one of those things that definitely got our attention and we, and we looked into. Yeah. And right, but if it does the job, um, yep. that's great. And um, the 3D printing community, like you said, is just a really big open source community. Uh, people aren't keeping these designs to themselves. They're putting it out there uh, for other people to use and they comment on and they even make better. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, just that collaboration uh, between folks. Yep. Is the Thingiverse is a very community. active community. That's right. Yeah. I think you made an important point in terms of the precision. I think we could see a lot of places where open source maybe replaces some things that are um, you know, for, for prototyping and lab building, but I think there's a certain level of precision that, at least in optics, that hasn't been achieved yet, and to some extent metal, and, unless you're doing post-processing. There's just a certain amount of precision, especially when you're in optical systems or aerospace or, or even biomedical, where mm -hmm. there's a certain level of precision that isn't quite addressed yet by additive manufacturing, so there's still a space for that, but I think additive is definitely going to take a lot more of that um, rapid prototyping and, and low volume and low cost space. Now, if it really does become commonplace, it'd be interesting to see certain industries like the toy industry, uh, instead of buying your toy at a local retailer yeah. and they're just selling you the, 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 the program yeah. to <laughs> have it printed right at your home. Merry Christmas, you just right. your, uh, <laughs> print your toy under Here's the tree. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> no need for Santa to come yeah. down the tree. Yeah, right. <laughs> He just hey, emails me. It takes the fun out of it a little. I know. He's going to download yeah. it to yeah. your 3D printer. Like, then he just walks around with a bunch of discs. Yeah. <laughs> What's a disc? Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. He's walking around yeah. in the cloud. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the first part of our discussion on additive manufacturing. Please be sure to check out part two of this topic next, where we will discuss the impact of 3D printing on IP protection, the future of additive manufacturing, how additive manufacturing and automation impact the job market.